Hello, uh, Jim Howard here in Fort Worth, Texas. Today's date, it is Monday, October 22nd of 2018. And going to update you on a few things, and then I'm going to actually finally get around to answering a question from, I guess it's Tarek Gurney. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh been messing with the computer and watching a lot of, a lot of YouTube videos. Um, so let me update you. Um, my cell phone, the blue Vivo 11 Plus, uh, I mentioned that the face recognition there, okay, that uh, it worked well. When the light is, I have two big lights on in here now, by the way. I've had a couple times where the light was very dim and this had problems doing the facial recognition. Of course, I still had the fingerprint and then I still also could, you know, and, and you can combine them if you wanted to. Uh, so that, the other thing is the video, which I mentioned before, <clears throat> the video, I don't think is very well, but all I, I have, I've just clicked, you know, video. I haven't gone in to see if I have any adjustments that I can make into the video, so I can't judge on that. And pictures, same thing, I haven't. Images seem to be okay, but I'm not sure about that. Um, the device I got for just placing this on the charger, which I can't really show you right now. It's because it's underneath. Uh, I've had to adjust it a few, you know, but it tells you, you know, and it shows you a, uh, you know, line up, center it or whatever. It, it does that. So, um, so I'm, I haven't made up my mind. So it kind of worries me that that's a magnetic device. And uh, so, like, anyway, I've been watching some videos. Well, I'm always watching a lot of YouTube videos. And I'm thinking of going, not, I'm not going to go back to the Blue Yeti. I have a ton of microphones here. This is the Blue Yeti. And it's a cardio, so you have to have this thing in your mouth before. And I just can't go that route. Same with these. I have several of these. Different manufacturers, same microphone. They even have the same number, BM800 or whatever on it. Sure looks nice. I've even in the past had two mic stands, hooked them up. Uh, problems I've had in the past... Uh, it seems like that, uh, well, one, you do need to have them close. But the other thing is um, that uh, I would have, it would sound, everything would sound great to me, and then I'd get comments from you all, from somebody that um, you're only hearing sound out of one channel, right or left, I forget which. I tried messing with that. I think I'd have it corrected and fixed. And then uh, have a, you know, then somebody else would say, hey, it's not working. I have, uh, in the past, I played with these. You've heard audio. I have four or five different devices like this. This was kind of expensive uh, for plugging in microphones and mics and adjusting it. This one here. I couldn't figure out what in the hell, which ones, you know, what to press, I mean, what to twist, what to turn. Um, so today I have a new device like this audio box that's coming that is super simple. It should be here today. So I'm going to be hooking up. And then I have a micro, a different microphone. I'll 
probably the next couple because it's going to take a week for the device coming tomorrow. I get like next day delivery from Amazon, and then I ordered the microphone, same price, but I ordered it from um, New Egg. It could probably take about a week to. Sometimes they surprise me. Probably going to take about a week to get here, so. You're probably going to hear some different microphones, but the big thing will be when I get today the audio box and then when I get the new microphone, because it's not a cardio, it's a dynamic, and you don't have to have those in your mouth. So that's going to be the big test. But So I may be getting rid of the headphones. So you would not believe how much of this stuff I have. I thought about bringing it all out here and stacking it up. But then I'd have to put it away. So I just grabbed some that were close. So let me go to this. I asked for comments in Turkey. Turka? T-A-R-I-K. Takar? Gurney. Jim, the audio saw a great improvement after you changed the level on the software. Thanks. So you said you'd accept questions. I do have one. How was it, what was it like to live before all of these technologies? So I'm going to count that as one question because he, um, let me count that as one question because he has some more here and I think the way I am, I'd get sidetracked, and I'll probably get sidetracked anyway. So, um, how was it like to live before all of these technologies? I was born in 1941 in Kansas City, Missouri, and spent f four years in California during World War II with my parents. You know, I was a baby, of course. They came back and after World War II ended, 1945. Spent the rest of my life, basically. I, I, sh I do want to talk about sometime a summer that I think would have been like 1953 or 54, someplace in there. I spent an entire summer uh, in, uh, let's see, South Carolina. My father was working at the H-bomb uh, plant, Savannah, Georgia, and we lived in government trailer. My my mother and I went out because my dad was working there. And there were hundreds of government trailers without air conditioning. And uh, so I was there a summer. This is before the civil rights movement. Of course, there's always been a civil rights movement, but this is before the 1960s. Uh, so I'm going to, I want to, but for that I want to make a video and I want to put some images in. I want to actually do some editing uh, of it. So, but what was it like before technology? <clears throat> so growing up um, in Kansas City, Missouri, um, uh, I was a only child. That was sort of unusual. There was, in my area, my block or two blocks or whatever, there was another boy that lived down the street, and he was an only child. But all the rest across the street from us, they had five, six, or seven kids. It was a multiple. So it was sort of unusual to be an only child. Um, both my parents worked. So I was home alone, uh, there was a year or two when my grandmother, my mother's mother, when she lived with us, and then she passed away of a heart attack. She had a total heart block when my mother was in grade school, and she was told uh, that... Uh, she wouldn't, my grandmother, I called her mom, uh, she was told that, you know, 
she wouldn't live a year or two, you know, that, and she managed to spend a year or two uh, actually raising me. Actually, though, I was, she was addicted to phenobarbital, which she took for pain or the arrhythmia or whatever. So in the second or third grade, my job was to, when the time came, give her her phenobarbital. You couldn't just give her the the vial because she would take too many, take them all. So uh, there was radio back then. Now, actually, I've been surprised in the past when I did some research. There was actual television signals transmitted many years before that. But commercially to Kansas City, Missouri, a city of metropolitan area of a million people, um, my parents went, and I went with them. We didn't go out. We didn't. I mean, we made some trips to the Ozarks from Kansas City. We, but we weren't people that went out to events and stuff like that. You know. Now, of course, when I was that age in grade school or whatever, uh, all of the kids in that neighborhood, we went to the movie theaters. The movie theater on Friday night, you'd see two movies, a cartoon maybe, or two movies and a uh, serial. Um, That'd be... Flash Gordon or something, and it would be, you know, be short. And <clears throat> like it'd be a car chase or something or other, whatever was going on. And then the hero would end up driving off of a gigantic cliff, certainly going to die. And then next week when you went to the thing, it would show, they'd show you that part up to there, and then you'd see him jumping out of the car. It was always that way. It could be in an explosion, whatever, and then you'd next week you'd come back and they would show. <clears throat> so you would see two movies, a newsreel maybe, and probably a newsreel, and a cartoon or something. Uh, then Sunday afternoons we went to the matinee because they changed, I guess. Friday night, I think, was then for Saturday and Sunday, new movies popped up. And so we'd go uh, Sunday afternoon. All the kids, the theater would be filled with kids. Uh, and that's that's when the movies were out, like the original uh, Dracula, uh, Wolfman, uh you know, all those type of movies. On, um, I went with a friend that I went to school with, and on Friday night when we would leave, it would be dark, of course, and a lot of times we'd be, you know, we'd walk down the middle of the street. Is there, Kansas City has a lot of trees, boulevard line trees, a lot of trees. And there, if the moon was out, there'd be shadows. We wouldn't walk on the sidewalk. We would like run down in the middle of the street. And then, of course, he came to his house first, and then, then I ran like hell to my house. Um, then we were always surprised when we came out of the movie theater on because you were in there for like two movies plus, and you'd go in. Of course, it was, but you'd come out, and it would also be this. It would still be. It was like a shock every week because you were so used to being in there and coming out and it being, you know, dark for Friday night. So you'd come out, oh, wow. So there was radio, and we would listen to Gangbusters, Sergeant Preston of the Yukon, uh, Vibber McGee and Molly, and that type of stuff. Hope Amos and Andy, which you won't see anymore because... <laughs> 
nowadays it would be considered extremely racist. I've seen a few clips, and I think you may be able to see it on YouTube, some samples, maybe. I really didn't think that it was that racist. Of course, at that time, you didn't think about it, but I don't think it was that that racist, but boy, everybody else, I'm sure, would. But I just thought it was funny and, you know, interesting. But, uh, uh, so all these radio programs, uh, Sergeant Preston of the Yukon, they had a uh, thing, you bought a cereal or something, and I, you, I think you sent in a dollar or something, and you got back a certificate for one inch of land in Canada, I guess it was. No, it was maybe Alaska. I think it was Alaska. One inch. And uh, many years ago, but I mean, you know, I mean, just a few years ago, uh, somebody asked a question in the newspapers. I think that was before the World Wide Web, and somebody asked a question about that. They said, yes, the, the land was still up there, and that certificate was still good. But, of course, what they did is they took X amount of space, which wasn't very much, you know. So you can't go and say, here is my one inch. You know, it was like there's X amount of land, miles, hectares, or whatever they, you know, and it was, a, you know, a joint thing. But uh, so there were radio programs. In 1949, my parents and I went to the Municipal Auditorium in downtown Kansas City, and the only thing they were showing was television that was coming to Kansas City. And um, I'm not sure how they did it. They didn't have VHF tape or beta tape. Uh, would it be kinemoscope? I'm not, but they had these TV. There was no TV station in Kansas City, Missouri. There was one coming. And they had these TVs up, and you could walk around, and you could see various things running on these TV sets. And then you could also purchase a TV set. <clears throat> I believe we purchased it right there. Maybe we went later to Sears or Montgomery Wards or someplace. I think we actually bought it like there. A television set and so we had a television set at home black and white of course and uh, this is before of course cable and it just sat there and uh, waiting for WDAF on Channel 4 to begin broadcasting in 1949 and I can remember um, so I would have been about what eight or eight years old uh, when, you know, WDAF then said, okay, you know, tonight at, I forget, 7 or 8 p.m., we're going to broadcast. And so they came on the air, and it was something like a travelogue because they didn't have any content, uh, a travelogue or something like wonderful Hawaii or something. And then after an hour or so, they went off. And then I think that's when they started, like the next day it would be on for an hour. And then at some point they went to regular television programming. Now regular television programming was uh, 6 in the morning or so. They would come on the air. Of course later we got, you know, a second TV station, Channel 5 I believe, and then we got another later, Channel 9. And then we got UHF uh I think that was PBS or whatever on that channel. <clears throat> but to begin with, it was one channel. And uh, they would broadcast till, I don't know, 11 o'clock at night or maybe midnight. Then they would play the national anthem. I guess they probably played it in the morning too. But they'd play the national anthem and then they would go off the air. Um, then in the morning, like I said, at six or so in the morning, they would, but not on Sunday because people went to church 
on Sunday morning, so they wouldn't broadcast on Sunday till 11 in the morning or something, <clears throat> which was sort of interesting because I was interested in shortwave radio. That was my hobby. That started, well, in 1955, that started. So I wouldn't have done it. Maybe I did it before 19 with the television. I don't think so. But since the TV went off at night, um, you could flip on the channels when you just got this snow or whatever, but then there would be stations that were still broadcasting. And because of ionospheric conditions, sometimes you could see, and they would identify about every 30 minutes with their test pattern and you'd get their call. Or sometimes they would say, you know, what station it was. Uh, on Sunday morning, since they didn't start broadcasting till in Kansas City, as the other stations across the United States were starting to broadcast, I picked up with just rabbit ears uh, TV from Canada, TV from Mexico, and even TV from Cuba. Of course, sometimes you'd be watching it, really good picture, and then, of course, you know, it would go out. But uh, the kids back then, we didn't spend a bunch of time inside watching TV or listening to the radio. We played outside, and we played cowboys and Indians. We played guns. We played army. Uh, we, when it was Halloween, uh, or the 4th of July or something, we would have, well, we didn't have fire, we had it for the 4th of July. You know, we would have all kinds of fire, and you could shoot them. Now you can't shoot fireworks. Well, I'm sure you can some places, but <clears throat> we had some powerful things, and we had ladybugs too, lady ladyfingers, that were f pretty weak, and so I would and some of the other kids, we would dig into the red clay of Missouri, and we put our little soldiers that you can still buy in the stores or whatever in different, you know, we'd put them in there and then we'd throw lady fingers at them or whatever, but we played guns and all the time. A certain time of year there was a tall plant that grew that had sort of a bulb on the bottom of it. It was a weed and so that we'd throw those as like spears, you know, if a family were to get a washing machine or something else in a big box, we'd put that out there and the other kids would be in the box and we'd throw with water guns. We always had water guns. We'd be blasting at the house or, blast, you know, the cardboard box. Bicycles. And the, when we were out of school, uh, we'd get on our bikes and we would ride all over. We were never concerned about being kidnapped. We weren't per concerned about it. Never thought about anything about a pervert or a kidnapper or something happening to it. We'd just ride all over our neighborhood, but it was a, we'd go a long ways around, riding around on our bikes. And generally, I mean, you might go home to go to the bathroom. You might go home to get a snack or whatever. But you stayed out until the street lights kicked on when it got dark and then that was your parents had told you you know when the street lights you know come on in and two also I don't know I doubt if it I don't know if it's true or not but we would hear an airplane go over about nine o'clock at night we'd say oh that's the mail plane I'm not sure if that was accurate or not but uh We um, didn't have any high-tech toys. I mean, you know, wind up, oh, wow, now, you know, how I've, kids now have little cars that they can, well, I had a wagon, Western Flyer wagon. I had a scooter that had balloon tires on it. I, um, of course, had a bicycle. Um Now, the bicycle that I got, I forget what year I got it. I could look. Um, 
at some picture, old pictures, and I could because I could give you because like there's like one picture of me inside the house, sitting on the new bicycle, and there's a date on the picture or whatever. But uh, remember, I didn't have any brothers or sisters, so I got my bicycle, and of course my dad was. My dad, my dad didn't go out really and throw a baseball with me. My dad didn't go out and uh, show me how to ride a bicycle or anything else. So, got my bicycle. All my other friends, because you know, they had brothers and sisters with, you know, then they had bikes to pass down or whatever. They didn't have to wait till getting a bicycle. And so I went out with my bike. We lived in a hilly area. Well, that for that at that time. And uh, so I pushed my bicycle with my friends. They were riding, and I was walking, pushing it, or whatever. And so finally, they got tired of that, and they said, "You know, we're not going to ride with you anymore, because you don't ride the bike; you push the bike." We were at the top of a big hill, and they said, "Ride the bike, get on the bike." So I got on the bike. I had really no idea how to stop the bike, or else I panicked going out. Went down, hit a curb. I went flying up off of the bicycle, came down, you know, didn't hurt myself, but then I could ride a bicycle after that. Uh, back then, there were, there was a morning and evening newspaper. There, uh, the telephone back then was a party line phone, so there were other people on your phone line. You'd so you'd, when you pick up the phone, if somebody was talking, then you put it back down. But you'd be talking, and you'd hear somebody pick up the phone and, you know, put it back down or whatever. Eventually, you know, you could get your own, which cost a little more. You could get your own, you know, phone line. Um, I was thinking, let's see, telephone, newspaper. Actually, Kansas City might have had even a second or third newspaper, but it got down to where it was like, you know, morning and evening, the Kansas City Times and the Kansas City Star. And now, I well, when I was there, it finally went to, it was just, you just got the evening paper, the Kansas City Star, if I remember correctly. So... Uh, <clears throat> When I was a kid, that'd be in the same thing, second, third grade or whatever. The place we lived in used a coal furnace. So I didn't have to do it very often. So I guess it was, I'd have to occasionally go down and put, in the wintertime, put coal into the furnace. Uh, of course, no air conditioning. Uh, when you'd go to a movie theater, it would be air conditioned in the summertime, and that was. I can remember my mother and I going to downtown Kansas City to the RKO RKO movie theater downtown, and that was like a palace. You went in, and it was like you're being in a palace, and was air cooled. Um, ice or the back then we had an ice box. Not a refrigerator. In fact, I still call, I call refrigerators ice boxes. <laughs> you would have an ice box, and a ice man would come with his truck, with blocks of ice on the back, and you'd put a sign up in your window. And if the sign was turned a certain way, that meant you want a full block, or a half block, or a quarter. He would chip it. He had a leather thing or whatever over his shoulder. He'd take it up and he would put it in the ice box for you. And then, of course, it melted. So you had to remember to occasionally, there was a tray underneath it. You had to take and, you had to take and dump that out. Um, eventually... When I became older, we had more TV stations. I got into shortwave radio. In 1955, I actually got a shortwave radio. That was my hobby for years. 
I put out a club publication that went out worldwide, mainly the U.S., for the club. I had to send out 500 copies of it. I used a mimeograph machine. I had to address them. There were, I could mimeograph under labels, but then people sometimes didn't renew. There was new people. And I was thinking back then, oh, there's got to be some better. And, of course, eventually the Internet and then the World Wide Web and whatever. Um uh, I ended up doing a radio program that was broadcast two or three times a week depending on the seasons because of the ionospheric conditions. I recorded it at KMBC Radio on tape and then I mailed it to New York City to be broadcast out two or three times a week. Um... So let's see, technology, um, no, I don't think we were supposed to be talking about technology, or was it, wait a minute, how was it like to live before all of these technology? So I get, I'm going to stop on, I'm not going to go past, you know, not going to go into the, when technology arrived, although... Well, I think that's the next question. Um, I think that goes into the next question, and I think I want to make that a separate video because uh, the next question that he asked was, how was the communication between people? Oh, I uh, back to the back to that question. I was into the shortwave radio, and so I was sending re reception reports to the Vatican and the BBC, and and all these stations getting back cards, verification cards, stuff like that. I also pen pal'd starting when I was in grade school, all the way through high school, and until I was twenty six with a girl my age in Spain. And then I corresponded with a boy my age, the same thing up until I was 26. He actually went to work for NHK, the Japanese Broadcasting System. Um, when I got married at age 26, my wife objected to me corresponding with a girl and she didn't even let, want me to spend time, so both of those came to an end. Um, we exchanged, the, the boy and I, we exchanged tapes on a tape reel back and forth. I think that was before cassette tapes, I believe. And uh, so I, he would record local Japanese stations and I would record you know, U.S. stations, that type of stuff. Send it back and forth. Um, so there was pen palling, and there was other things, exchanging of, like, QSL cards, uh, verification cards, we, like we might have our own that we made up, and we'd trade those with people. That was part of the club thing that I did. And that got me... <clears throat> contacted by people to people. They were just organizing the first people to people thing. And I told you about that. I mentioned in another video I got contacted and became a member of the board of directors or whatever of the people to, first people to people organization. And also when I was in high school, I belong, I did I carried my books home. I never opened them. I never studied. But I was in civil defense, ground observer corps. Uh, what else? All types of 
extra well they weren't considered you know the school didn't know about them but I was doing all that kind of I sure wasn't doing any studying but I was interested in technology because of shortwave radio and because of having to put out for years this 36 page see 36 pages would be well it wasn't always 36 pages double-sided had to use a regular typewriter used stencils it was a sheet it was like a gummy uh, thing and your key you wouldn't have the ribbon on the typewriter it would punch the holes and then you put it on a mimeograph machine drum that was filled with ink and the paper would be in a would go through as you turned it one and come out then I'd have to staple these together have to send them off or whatever but then you could have you could take a not exactly a picture but you could take drawings or simple actually you could take a picture if it wasn't uh, oh by the way photography I was also into photography as a kid early but with the um, stencils you could go to an office supply place take some pictures or drawings they would burn it into a stencil then I could cut out the picture or whatever and cement it into the, my stencil and send out things um, with um, with that club publication that I put out, SWL, American Shortwave Listeners Club. Uh, by the way, I'm in a book. Let's see. Uh, where is the... Oh, here it is. It's on top. I didn't have to unlock this. Nope. Let's see. Nope, that's not it. Where's my book? Anyway, I'm in a book repeatedly that uh, a, a gentleman wrote about shortwave listening days. I'm in there multiple places. But um, all the time that I was doing those things, I was thinking there's got to be some way to make these, you know, to make addressing and typing up this stuff, all this stuff of, it's got to be easier. Uh, the photography I was into, I had a, the way I really got interested in that is I was really young and my dad was working, I think up in Iowa, for the Boilermakers again, not a nuclear plant, but power plant or something. And he bought a Leica, an old Leica camera uh, from somebody up there. And it was used. And uh, he came home for the weekend or whatever and gave that to me. And then I got interested. And then I ended up on my own getting cameras and I would keep. Uh, the one I enjoyed the most was an inexpensive uh, twin lens reflex camera. That's one that had two lenses on it, so you were taking a picture through one and the other you looked through. So there was no blackout or whatever, but then you looked down into the viewfinder and you could see your picture and that, that was just so great. And they were square. 120 and 220 film, I think. The 220 film, you got twice as many uh, pictures on the... Uh, and I really enjoyed that camera. Uh, and then through life, I had a bunch of, bunch of cameras and always passed them on to my kids when I would get a new one. I've got three. My kids are all grown and they buy their own cameras now. Um, techno oh, technology. Um,
I think I think I've covered but I want to do the next one I want to do how was the communication between people but I wanted to talk a little bit about later when computers first came around in chat rooms and stuff like that also how do you think the technology affected people in terms of morality education and communication that's going to have to be a separate video and that'll be a little bit political I'm sure so this has been a 40 minute video and you didn't once see I didn't pop anything up on the screen except me uh, I'm using Movidia Video Suite to capture this video and I'm using a, I, I think my $170 Logitech camera has broke. I still haven't had a chance to try it on another computer. I could have my son try it. Again. I'm just going to wait till I hook up the uh, Chrome box. Um, I can't believe it broke. But uh, so I'm using a Logitech camera here. And I forget which one it is, but it's not a hundred. It's not a hundred and seventy dollar one. It's one of those about a hundred dollars at the time. Um, I'm recording this at twenty four frames per second to see what it's. Uh, I wonder if the voice is going to be out of sync. We'll have to see. But. Some of these videos that you get for the next few days, I'll be playing with the getting away from the headset and with the new box I'm getting. And there may be some problems. I'll check it though before you know I do it. But uh, I have to make sure I check to make sure coming out of both you know speakers. But then, as I say, about a week, I'm going to have a different microphone. And uh, with that box, it might be a much better, you know. But here we're going to see, at, this is 24 frames a second. And I think the audio says it's 44K audio. So we've gone about 43 minutes. Um, let me think just for a second here. Is there anything else? I um, think that's it. So I do appreciate you watching. If, you, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. And thank you very much for watching.